hands. Speak to quarters. Now, out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire! <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. French advance at Riga, but now both the armies had dug in there stubbornly. Unfortunately for us, this meant a stalemate as summer faded into autumn and flurries of snow hurried us towards one of those early Russian winters. Riga Bay, where my squadron lay, was covered with a thin film of ice. I don't like it at all, Bush, not at all, with winter coming. I know, sir. If we stay on here much longer, we're certain to be frozen in. And yet the Admiralty... My orders from the Admiralty are nothing if not explicit. Remain here at all costs, give every support within our power. Riga must be protected to the last man and ship. Their words. Yes, sir. If only we could be sure that Alexander would hold her. Yes, she doesn't have a reputation for constancy, I'm afraid. Oh, well, at least we're helping to block the French path to St. Petersburg I said, Bush, what are they doing up for it? Midshipman's class? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, with all this recent inactivity, our youngsters needed some work. Uh. I ordered regular resumption of all peacetime instruction under the sailing master, Mr. Tooth. Excellent idea, Bush. <laughs> Midshipmen are a curious breed, Bush. I'm afraid their lot is not a happy one. Uh, did I ever tell you of my first dubious distinction in the service of His Majesty? Hmm? <laughs> The day I came aboard the old Justinian as midshipman, she she lay just off Portsmouth, <laughs> and I was seasick, Bush, <laughs> seasick in Spithead Harbor. <laughs> I was too thin, too tall, too young, too shy, too gawky, not long out of a quiet country village. Nervous, but deeply conscious of my new estate in life. Poor old Keen, Captain the Justinian. Already a sick man, very, very morose. Yet he was not unkind that day when I reported to his cabin, rather shakily. Mr. Hornblower, I'm glad to welcome you on board my ship. Yes, sir. Is that, that is... Um, aye, aye, sir. Your age is... Uh, let me see... Um, Seventeen. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Birthday, July 4th, 1776. Hmm. I'd been six years as lieutenant before you were born, Hornblower. Yes, sir. Doctor's son, eh? How far did your education go? Oh, I studied Greek at school, sir. I uh, read Cicero, too. Better if you could foresee a squall in time to get the Tegallans in. We've no use for ablative absolutes in the Navy. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. Did you bring your dunnage aboard with you? My uh, 
my sea chest, sir? Oh, yes, sir. It's at the, uh, at the entry port. Good. I'll get a boy to show you down to the midshipmen's quarters. Well, obey orders, Hornblower. Learn your duties, and no harm can come to you. That will do. Thank you, sir. Despite the captain's words of the bush, harm began to come to me almost at once. I was led down ladder after ladder into the twilight of the tween decks and came at last to an especially gloomy recess. There, half a dozen shirt-sleeved young men, all a good deal older than myself, sat around a table, lighted faintly by a candle, and I entered rather hesitantly. Well, well, who's this? Who's this? Can it be our ranks of swelling? Simpson, look at him. Look, he's positively green. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm quite all right. It's, it's just... Well, that, that shore boat did toss quite a bit in, on the way out now. Do you know what I, it is, Simpson? I do believe he's seasick. What'll they send us next, Simpson? Seasick in Spithead? Oh, we're still at anchor, Tony. Did you know it? Seasick in Spithead. <laughs> I thought to myself that I was now labeled for life, but I'd soon cease to care. A moment later, I was prone in my hammock. In the days that followed, I learned a great deal more about the arrogant Mr. Simpson. There he goes now. Notice that strut? I have to admit, he is a handsome brute. Yes, sir. I suppose so. You see, Hornblower Simpson's a man who's angry at himself and at the world. He had high hopes, but just before you came on board, he was sent back here as senior warrant officer of midship. Oh, Mr. Commission. Exactly. Too weak in mathematics, Captain's board turned him down. So acting Lieutenant Simpson is now a midshipman again. Maybe for years. And Simpson must be 35 at least. I understand him better now. Makes you, well, almost sorry for him, doesn't it? Don't waste your sympathy. Well, thank you, Gerard. You know... You're the first aboard who's taken time to say a word to me on any subject. Just keep out of his way as much as you can. Any time anyone rebels, he just pounds him senseless with those big fists. He even made a good prize fighter. And it's always the other who has the black eye and gets the captain's mast for fighting. All of us hate the man, Hornblower. And that's an understatement. All of them did hate Simpson, yes. And some of them even showed it. But from the first, this didn't prevent him singling me out as his favorite victim. His tyrannies were petty, but ingenious. Mr. Holder, don't put on your coat. You haven't finished here. Yeah, but you said that... I said swab down our birth deck. You call that a clean deck? Oh, Mr. Simpson, if you haven't just tracked... Back on your hands and knees, Holder. Put some bristle into it. We've got any. That's better. Haven't forgotten how to give you a beating yesterday, have you? No more miserable, lonely midshipman ever rode a British ship. We hadn't even set sail yet. Weeks passed and we still lay in Spithead, awaiting the rest of the Channel Fleet. Shyness kept me from making friends and... Simpson's persecutions mounted daily. I even thought of death as one way out. In my black despair, the waters of Spithead promised a friendly escape, and, and often at night I made elaborate plans for suicide. And then, one afternoon, some of us had shore leave in Portsmouth. By chance, I wandered into the George Inn as three of our ship's company were looking for a fourth of their card table. Why, it's young Hornblower. Uh, I say, youngster, do you play whist as a means of passing the time? Why, yes, sir. Well, Lieutenant Masters, yes, I do. Ah, oh, you're just the man we want, then. Haven't been able to find anybody else. Come over here. We badly need a fourth. Mr. Simpson and Mr. Graves and I... Uh... Simpson? Well, well, I... I like whist, sir, but... Uh, well, uh, well, I've just remembered I, I, I have an appointment. Oh, no, no, no. I, I shan't let you escape now. Don't mind, Simpson. <laughs> As senior lieutenant, I could order you to stay, young man. Now, come along, come along. Yes, sit down, Hornblower. Simpson deigned to give me a curt nod as I sat down. He and Graves had been drinking wine. Their faces were quite flushed. 
Now, it happened that I did like whist for years. I'd made a fourth at home, and I even had a kind of passion for it. Excellent, excellent. Now we can cut for places and partners. Ah, Simpson and Graves against you and me, Hornblower. Shilling a trick of stakes, is that too steep, gentlemen? As you wish, Lieutenant. I like any sort of gambling. Good, good. Your deal, Mr. Graves. Let us be at it. It soon appeared that Simpson was a very poor whist player. Um, those shaky mathematics, possibly. On the other hand, I was, um, well, rather experienced. And Masters and I took the first game and the second, and Simpson grew more and more sullen and angry. And then came the end of the third game. But the rest of mine. What do you mean? I've got the King of Hearts still in my hand. Five tricks, game and robber. But don't I take the... Oh. All right, Hornblower. You know too much about this game, my cocky friend. Huh. Now the backs of the cards as well as the front, don't you? Simpson was muddled. I'm quite sure he spoke without intention. But suddenly a plan occurred to me in stark outline. His life or mine. Perhaps it was my only escape from an intolerable existence. That's a... That's a very insulting remark, Mr. Simpson. Huh? I shall... I shall have to ask satisfaction, I'm afraid. Satisfaction? No, no, see here, Hornblower, you can't be... Now, look, look, dueling's a serious business. I'm sure Mr. Simpson will explain that he was merely joking. I've been accused of cheating at cards, Mr. Masters. That's a hard thing to explain away. Mr. Hornblower, I must insist. Uh, oh, no. Now, now, come. The wine was in and the wit was out. Let's forget this. Oh, with pleasure, sir. If Mr. Simpson will apologize at once and uh -huh. admit that he spoke in a manner most ungentlemanly. Apologize to you, you little whippersnapper? To you? Oh, I'll see you roasted by the devil first. That does it, gentlemen. Go! Oh! half his age. You're hardly more than a boy. Are you determined to press this murderous business? Yes, sir. But why? Why? I waived the pros and cons, sir. Well, I'll be frank. Simpson has the advantage physically. And these conditions are the only ones that give me a, a, an even chance. Mathematically, one shot from each of us is better. All right, all right, I understand. Well, since you won't call it off, you'd better know. The captain's ordered me to attend the duel in person. Mr. Hipper White, the surgeon, will also attend. Aye, aye, sir. Very well. The place selected is the small heath north of Portsmouth. The hour at dawn tomorrow. The two parties will go separately, of course. Mathematically, I trust you've made the right decision, Mr. Hornblower. I hope you'll get some sleep tonight. Good luck. Only one yard between. That means no distance is to be faced off. Will you stand here, Mr. Simpson? Mr. Hornblower, here. You're almost breast to breast, gentlemen. For the last time, can you not be reconciled? Well, then, so be it. We haven't settled who's to give the word. Let Mr. Masters give it, Graves. Why not? Very well. I'll say one, two, three, and fire. With the last word, you can fire as you will. Are you ready? Ready. Yes? Ready. One, two, three, fire! I pulled the trigger. There was a click, and that was all. Mine was the unloaded pistol. A half second passed, and Simpson fired. Another click, and both of us still stood there, 
stiff and dazed. A misfire, by heaven. A misfire, Holmes. Give me those pistols. The loaded one might still be hanging fire. Which was the loaded one? That's better not to know. I'm shuffling them. But, sir, why not a second shot? There will be no second shot, Mr. Gerard. Honor is satisfied. No one can now think little of Mr. Simpson if he regrets his hasty words. Nor of Mr. Hornblower if he accepts those regrets graciously. <laughs> their faces! Their faces! Oh, you young fools! You ought to see how you all look! Solemn as cows! Mr. Hepplewhite, your behavior is indecorous. Our coaches are waiting on the road. The cutter is at the jetty. I think all of us can do with a little breakfast now, including Mr. Hepplewhite. That should have ended the affair, of course, but aboard the Justinian there were whispers, whispers that circulated forward and after. And at last I... I decided permission to speak privately with Captain Keane. I was so hurt and so angry. I, I behaved rather clannishly, I'm afraid. Sir? Now, keep your head, young man. I <clears throat> I can guess what you're going to say to me. Look, those pistols in the duel were not loaded, neither of them. Hepplewhite blabbed, I suppose. Am I am to understand that it was by your orders, sir? That is correct. I gave those orders to Mr. Masters. Sir, sir it was an unwarrantable liberty, sir. And possibly it was, but I saved a life for the King's service, a young life. Both you and Simpson have had your courage amply proved and no one's harm. You've touched my personal honor, sir. Uh, do I understand that you are now issuing me a challenge? Well, Let me remind you, Mr. Hornblower, of one useful regulation of the Navy. No junior officer may challenge his superior to a duel. Indeed, uh, it is a court-martial offense. Well, well, yes, now, I know, sir. Now, here is some gratuitous advice. You have fought one duel with honor. That is good. Never fight another. As some men acquire a taste for dueling, they're never good officers. It seems to become a habit to, uh, well, uh, to occupy the center of the stage. I... I understand, sir. Uh, well, there's I another I... matter I wanted to take up with you, Mr. Hornblower. Uh, Captain Pellew of the frigate Indefatigable has room for another midshipman. Perhaps you haven't been too happy here, and Pellew is partial to a game of whist. Has no good forth on board his ship, in fact. Um, he and I have agreed to consider favorably your application for a transfer, if you should care to make it. A frigate, sir? Why, that would be... Why, anybody would jump at the chance of... Oh. Well... What were you about to say? Is it settled, then? Oh, it's, it's very good of you, sir. I, I, I don't know how to thank you, but, but you accepted me as a midshipman, sir, and of course I shall remain with you. I, uh, I appreciate your saying that. I, I know the heartburning it entails. But I think I'm going to insist on your accepting Pellew's offer. This ship is not the place for you. This ship with her ailing, outworn captain. Oh, sir, please. I, uh, don't I don't interrupt me. I have the good of the service in mind, Mr. Hornblower, when I suggest you go. And uh, it might be less disturbing for us if you did. <laughs> I never saw him again. He's been dead a long time now, Bush. I've often thought of him, though, when I when I became a captain and learned of all those extra burdens that go with the command. Yes. Well, well, at least we've passed a little while away from a Russian winter. And we've still got Riga to defend in the morning. It must be the ravens up there. Yeah. Lieutenant Cole must be worried. Now, kindly make the proper signal, if you please, Captain Bush. Commodore on board. All is well. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, 
is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.